you'll take some of these questions back to your, your members and the committees and let them know that these are things that ought to be considered. Uh, th this is uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Keane's a very popular economist. He's in big demand all over the world. Uh, he's developed a very advanced way of analyzing economic data and, uh, and, and showing what it's telling us. He's a professor of economics and finance at the School of Business at the University of West Sydney in, uh, in Australia. Uh, he's in big demand because he's one of the few economists who predicted the 2007 financial crash before it started. Now, how did he do it? Well, he looked at the data. He went public and warned the world that a financial crash was imminent back in 2005. And uh, for this, he was awarded what was called the Revere Award for his early warning. Uh, Professor Keene's analysis is often sought after by the media and by hedge fund managers and others who are involved in financial markets. Uh, his recent book, Debunking Economics, A Naked Emperor Dethroned, exposes how far economic theories have departed from reality or relevance. Uh, yet these are the theories that are often used to advise governments around the world, including our own government. Now he's going to present his empirical analysis of today's economy and compare it with the period before and during the Great Depression. Using this analysis, Professor King will show us some lessons that hopefully we'll be able to uh, uh, learn to help us avoid the mistakes that were made in the Great Depression. So uh, uh, without uh, going further into his presentation, which he will do, uh, Professor, welcome. And again, I want to thank all the staffers who are here. This is a, a very valuable presentation, and I, I think that uh, you'll uh, have some information to take back to the members and the committee, which will be quite useful at this time. So okay. thank, thanks, thanks very much, Dennis, and thanks for coming along. I have to make it uh, both uh, your these time and hopefully interesting as well. But clearly, the fiscal cliff is a, a new phenomenon for the American Congress. One thing I've always had as a defining feature of American Congress is a place where nothing happens in great detail. In other words, there's such a degree of logjam normally that things just don't occur. But now what you've set up is a situation where if you don't make a decision, something will occur, which is quite an intriguing shift on the past. And uh, I want to go through a number of just quick oversights I'm going to go through here that make the analysis I'm giving you different to what you'd be getting from the Congress Budget Office and getting from economists at either end of the political spectrum. And that is because I see understanding banks, banks, debt and money is key to knowing where this crisis came from. And the crazy thing is for people who haven't done an economics degree and, and they haven't been schooled in this whole way of thinking is that most people who are non-economists think that economists are going to be experts on, on money and obviously on banks and debt because, you know, banks manage the money. So you'd think that that would be the usual story. You know, you're an economist, you must be an expert on money. Well, even the most radical of mainstream economists ignores banks completely. This is a recent debate I had with Paul Krugman uh, on, the, on the blogosphere. And in reference to one of my papers, he wrote his all for including the banking sector in stories where it's relevant. But why is it relevant to a story about debt and leverage? Now, that's the, yeah, if that's the most progressive of the conventional economists, the other extreme, the ones he normally fights them, he calls freshwater economists, completely ignore not just banks, but instability in every possible last manifestation. So that's the range of debate you've been getting largely in Congress. And that's as far as it's gone to analysing the banking sector. Now, I see them as crucial because in a very, very simple way, and it does make sense to think about this at the, at the sort of... Uh, um, small bank level in your own personal accounts because banking does aggregate. What you do at an individual, contrary to what conventional economists think, does aggregate to the national level. So your own spending, you can spend money either out of your income or out of swiping your credit card. Exactly the same thing aggregates to the national level. The reason that economists don't consider what I consider here is they wrongly believe it doesn't aggregate. And they think one person's increase in borrowing means they have uh, more spending power, but the person they've borrowed from has less spending power, so they cancel it out. Now, that would be correct if we didn't live in a world with banks. And if you'd actually could borrow money, I'd be going to take some money out of Dennis's pocket, and therefore Dennis couldn't spend, whereas I could. That would be a legitimate reason to leave it out. That's not how the banking sector operates. So by making that mental cancellation process, that's why conventional economists miss the importance of the crisis. Now, when you put that together, what it does, it changes the basis of macroeconomic thinking. And the key way that it changes it is that if you look in an accounting sense, it's true that recorded expenditure equals recorded income. 
and even some of my non-Orthodox colleagues use that as a reason to also ignore the banking sector. But when you look at it from the point of view of what you can spend, what you can spend as an individual is your income plus the change in your debt, and because the banking sector can create that spending power without taking it away from anybody who's saved money, it aggregates to the national level. So at a national level, what I argue is the effective demand, the actual monetary turnover that finances buying and goods and services and also buying assets is income plus the change in debt. Therefore, you've got to analyse the dynamics of debt to know where the crisis came from, and that's why I saw it coming, because I, I do look at debt in a way that conventional economists don't. And it gives you guidance to what the future might hold. Now, I'm going to go backwards a bit in history. This is one chart that in trying to make the 14-page the limit I was given for writing this presentation. There's one slide I had to drop. This is a long-term look at the ratio of both private and public debt to GDP. Now, when we're talking now about this crisis, people have, have been saying for some time it's like the Great Depression. But I want to show why it really is like the Great Depression. This is the ratio of both private and public debt to GDP for the last pretty much century. And you can see that huge spike back in the Great Depression for the level of private debt to GDP. And we're higher this time. And equally you can see that the public sector debt was well below private sector debt there and then started to exceed it during the Second World War, obviously. Over here we're seeing rising public debt after there's been a trend for it to fall pretty much for the last 15, 20 years. So there is a genuine reason why we can compare the two periods. And what I'm going to now do is go into the actual dollar numbers behind those two ratio charts. So what we had, first of all, we did have a fall in GDP. If you look at the, the, the blue line is the uh, inflation-adjusted uh, GDP. The, well, that should be. It's red on my computer. It's black on your screen there. That is the... Uh, nominal dollars, and you can see that there's we 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 date the the, the uh, recession as starting from pretty much the beginning of 2008. That's the NDR's formal date for the start of the crisis. And you can see when that happened, a trend for rising GDP gave way to flat in real terms, and then a fall. In terms of nominal prices, there was a bit of a, a dip, and then a bit of a rise, and then about a year later, GDP started to fall. Now, looking at that, clearly it's a fall in income. For the entire economy. It matters, but I think you can tell just by, even without me showing you the other chart, that's nothing like what happened in the Great Depression. So, you know, why do we make the comparison? Well, this is where you have to start looking at the debt levels. Now, what I'm going to, this chart shows you both GDP, which is the dotted line, government debt, which is the thing which everybody's obsessing about inside this building, and private debt, measured in trillions of dollars. And now you can see something peculiar about the private data. First of all, private debt is far greater than public debt and also far greater than GDP. The ratio at this point of, of, of private debt to GDP was 303%. Okay. Even now, we're still approaching the level where public debt is 100% of GDP. And that's after a period of rising public debt. But it's still far, far lower than, pub, than, pri than private debt. And you can see that the trend was... This actually goes back virtually forever. If I go back right to 1952, all the way through, I'll show rising private debt. It has not fallen in nominal terms except when this crisis began, since the Great Depression. That's the first time private debt's actually fallen in absolute value. So let's now start analysing this and start looking at it in terms of the change in debt because my argument is that income or effective demand is, is a GDP plus the change in debt. So I'm not going to break down looking just at GDP. So the top line now is GDP. But the red and the blue lines, a red and black line for you, are the change in public debt and the change in private debt. Now here you can see the change in private debt per annum, the annual increase in private debt, was running at at least $2 trillion a year and peaked before the crisis began at over $4 trillion increase in one year. Now that's on a $14 trillion economy. So from my point of view, the increase in private debt that particular year increased demand over what it would have been from income alone by almost 30%, which is huge. Then, notice how this, started, this downturn coincides with the beginning of the crisis. And you go from a period where private debt was adding 
over four trillion dollars to our aggregate demand, from my point of view, to subtracting three trillion dollars from it. Now we're talking serious numbers. Now you can see the scale and why this is was thought to be such a huge crisis when it began. Public debt, on the other hand, a bit of a rise after 2004. I don't quite know why. It may have been something to do with war mobilisation, or it could have been a fear about a. a I'm going to get hell, hell no. Go back and take a look at the data to be sure. But you can see it's trending down, heading down towards a tiny level of increase, well under a trillion dollars per annum. And then about a year after the crisis begins, once the GDP starts to turn down, then you get an increase in public sector debt. Okay? And now what you're worried about is this, this, this gap here is the amount you're accumulating each year, which the fiscal cliff is trying to stop growing. And now what I'm going to do, um, I'll just to illustrate one important point here that I talk about in the document. There's two years here where the private sector is actually heavily reducing its level of debt. Okay? It isn't a case of the debt growing more slowly than income, which was the case for the previous six decades. It's literally reducing the level of debt outstanding. It fell from about 42, 43 trillion to about 38 trillion dollars. Now it's flatlining. So that's, uh, I'll just actually jump back one slide just to show you that little feature I didn't quite emphasise. Notice how you reached a peak, serious decline in the level of debt, and then it's been flatlining for about two years. I'm going to come back to the dangers of this happening again. Okay? That's that's the thing. I'm the most my biggest worry about the fiscal cliff is the potential to restart that process. So that's the deleveraging period. Now let's take a look at the picture in terms of how I define effective demand, which is GDP plus the change in debt. So I'm taking that GDP figure and then I'm going to add on the change in private debt and then I'm going to add on the change in private and public debt to show you just what the scale of turnaround was in effective demand in the economy when the crisis began. And I think now you'll see why the crisis was so damn, so damn, so damn huge. So the bottom line is GDP alone. This line, the darkish line on your screen, is the GDP plus the change in private debt. And the blue line is GDP plus the change in both private and public debt. So looking at the American economy when the crisis began, it was about a $14.5 trillion economy in GDP terms. But in terms of private sector spending, it was almost $18.5 trillion. Now that's spending which goes not just on buying goods and services, but also on buying assets. That was where Flip That House was being financed, speculation on Wall Street, IPOs, uh, leverage buyouts, all that sort of thing. So you've gone from this stage of an $18.5 trillion economy down to an $11.5 trillion one in two years. That's why your asset markets collapsed, that's why unemployment exploded. It's a huge change. When you add on the government's uh, debt finance expenditure, that boosted spending by about half a trillion dollars there, but down in the depths of the crisis, it was boosting it by one and a half trillion. So what it meant is rather than having a fall from an 18 and a half trillion to an 11 and a half trillion dollar economy, you had a fall from a roughly 19 to roughly 13. So rather than you know, virtually eight, eight, seven and a half, eight trillion dollar turnaround, it's about a six trillion. That's still big, okay, but it's much less than it would have been if the government spending hadn't been there. And a lot of that spend, some of that spending was deliberate, you know, the $700 billion stimulus package that Obama brought in in his first term, but a lot of it's also unavoidable. Your tax receipts fall, your welfare payments go up, you must have that increase. Now look up here and we're seeing that was a huge rate of decline in private debt, which could have continued. And I'll show you what happened during the Great Depression, it did continue. But instead it turned around very rapidly and now at this point we're back to the point where there's no particular change in the level of private debt over time. It's flatlining. So when I look at the flatlining of the rate of change, therefore the, the gap between the red line, which is um, the contribution changing, increasing private debt makes the spending, it's pretty much making no contribution at all, neither increasing nor decreasing. But the government spending is still adding about a trillion dollars to effective spending in the economy. And what you're talking about is reducing that by half a trillion. Okay. That means you're going to go from about a $17 trillion economy to a $16.5 trillion economy. But that's if you don't do anything to disturb that massive private debt that's still hanging over the economy. And that's my fear, you will disturb that level by doing it. Now I want to show you why it matters, because again, uh, when I try to make this case with even you know progressive economists like Paul Krugman, he'll come back to me and say, why does it matter? And the only reason, the only time that even the progressive end of the conventional economic spectrum thinks 
the change in debt matters is after you hit what they call the zero lower bound, when the Federal Reserve was forced by the crisis to reduce its reserve rate to 0.125%. They're saying after that point, there's going to be what they call a liquidity trap. So after that point, yes, there'll be some sort of relationship between change in debt and the level of unemployment, but beforehand, no, there won't be. This is no relationship. Take a look. That is the unemployment rate. This is the change in private debt. And this one here is the change in public debt. Now, when you take the unemployment ranging from zero over here to 12% up here, and this is the change of debt being measured on the other axis, and you can see they're almost like Rorschach plots, images of each other. Okay? When change of debt, when, you, when you, the, level of, the rate of change of debt increases, the level of unemployment falls. Now, it's not saying rising debt's a good thing all the time. The certain level of debt you need, private debt finances, investment, that's necessary. When it finances speculation and gambling as it did during the subprime, it's catastrophic in the long run. But it nonetheless it still employs real estate agents, valuers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it, there is a relationship between rising debt and falling unemployment. And the correlation coefficient, for those of you used to working this way, is minus 0.94 across that period of time. That's all, you know, virtually perfect correlation. On the other hand, here's public debt. Now notice public debt rises when unemployment rises. So you've got to think about what's actually going on there. It, it does rising public debt cause unemployment? No, it's obviously the other way around. The public debt rises when unemployment rises because the economy slows down, tax receipts drop, unemployment benefits rise. So there's a very, very strong causal relationship between the change in debt and the state of the economy. And I can go much further than this, data going back a long, long way, strengthening that case. This is just to get to in 14 slides. Now also, this change in debt doesn't just finance the uh, real economy, it also finances asset markets. So all that flip that house stuff that Americans had great fun playing, and my country is still playing, unfortunately. We haven't got a, away from the bubble down in Australia. What actually drove those house prices was accelerating private debt. And if you look at the correlation between the rate of change of mortgage debt as a percentage of GDP and the rate of change of real house prices, again, the correlation is very powerful. I can go in more detail again and show a relationship between accelerating debt and changing house prices, and I get a, a similar correlation to what I've got here. One, one drives the other. So it's, this is really showing you have what you can call a Ponzi economy or a Madoff economy, driving you driving up asset prices, causing apparent wealth, and then, of course, the crash coming in on top of that. Let's go back to the 1930s. But what I want to now do is try to make some argument from historical precedent about what you could experience if you go through the fiscal cliff without attenuating its impact. Now, first of all, of course, that was a much more severe pardon me, crisis. So here I've got the, uh, the nominal and real change in GDP. The nominal was worse, of course, because as well as falling output, you had deflation, falling prices. So the nominal fall in GDP from about $115 billion, and by the way, it is billion dollars, it's a lot, it, it, the inflation is doubled, uh, increasing by a factor of two over that time period, an exponential factor of two. But you went from a GDP of about $115 billion down to one of $55 billion in nominal terms, and even in real terms, about a 30% fall over just three years, an incredibly sharp crisis, so much worse than what we've been through this time round. The question is, why? Did you have, was it because the, the crisis back then was much worse than now? You know, was, there, was there a bigger level of debt and a bigger speculative bubble? We all know about the Roaring Twenties. I'm sure some of us are going to go and watch The Great Gatsby shortly. Okay? That's, that's the image we have of this speculative excess. Well, I'm afraid they have got nothing on Gen Y. Because this is the same chart now showing the level of debt, for private debt, public debt and level of GDP. And you can just tell visually Debt, private debt was higher than, than GDP during the Great Depression, but by nowhere near the scale we've been through this time round. So the scale of debt finance was much larger this time round, and government debt, again, the same sort of thing. Notice it's flat lines, and then when the crisis hits, it starts to rise. The same sort of causal relationship. Well, let's now drill down one step further and look at GDP plus the change in debt. And what you'll find is that there was a much longer period where the private sector delevered. And a possible explanation for why they spent this extended time deleveraging is because the public sector contribution was so weak compared to what we've been through this time round. The, the private sector continued to panic and delever because the public sector didn't attenuate the effect of the downturn. So now I have GDP as the top line there, and you can see the plunge in nominal GDP. 
The top line here is private debt, change in private debt. The blue line is change in government debt. Now notice the period of deleveraging here was four years long, whereas this time it was only a two-year period. From 1930 right out to 1934, the private sector was reducing its level of debt. And by reducing its debt, therefore, private sector spending was less than income, whereas the normal situation in a growing economy is private spending is greater than income. So that level of depressed spending, no in investment taking place, demand not turning up in shops, etc., etc. And then you had another period of two years more of it. So you actually double dipped into depression. We tend to forget that, but that was a crucial period. That's why I want to come back and say, what does that tell us about what might happen with the fiscal cliff? And notice the increase in public spending, as you can tell by remember the previous chart I've shown you with the, the situation now, far smaller than what we've been through this time around. Even though we see the New Deal as an exemplar of government spending and trying to stimulate a depressed economy, the scale of Obama's stimulus program and lot spending was bigger than the New Deal. It didn't build any Hoover dams, but it was bigger than the New Deal. Now let's now take a look at the um, effect and effective demand. So I'm adding together the change in debt and to GDP. And again, you can tell visually that the bubble in the 1920s was nowhere near as big as the one we've been through now. And the public sector was not making any contribution at all to spending when the bubble began. We had a period where the government was actually spending on top of the borrowing by the private sector, which is in some ways ex accentuating the level of the bubble before we, we went into the crash. Then there's this long period where spending is below GDP and the government slowly starts to increase its spending but as you can see the gap between those two lines tells you how large the deficit was, how much debt finance spending was going into the economy from the government and it was fairly minor and only by the, night, the time the New Deal came along was there any real impetus to government spending. But even that didn't last all that long. It petted out over here and I'll take you into a bit more detail in the next couple of slides but I think the government thought the worst is behind us, crisis is over, they slowed down their spending, and what happened was the private sector began deleveraging again. I can illustrate that in another chart here. So what you had was a dip back into depression. So here now we're looking at unemployment and the change in both private debt and public debt, and you can see that gigantic drop in private debt, seeing that as a percentage of GDP, a huge period. And again, th that dip there is like the little dip I showed you before how we went through, the very V-shaped one. That was, we, 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 we had discussions some time ago, V-shaped versus U-shaped recovery. We had, we had a V-shaped recovery in terms of the Great Depression. They had a U-shaped experience. Now, the reason why this may be U-shaped is government debt, first of all, wasn't sustained. Again, I think under Hoover, there was a belief the crisis was over. And you remember that famous talk when I think Hoover had a few um, welfare people turn up to him and he said, gentlemen, you're you're three months too late, the depression is over. I think that was in 1932, 33, 30, 31, 32. Then Roosevelt comes in, the New Deal, and a great boost of spending, but then it starts to decline once more. Now notice unemployment skyrockets to 25%. It falls under the influence of the New Deal at last. Not with any, you know, there's, there's some volatility there clearly, but it's heading down. I think at this stage, the feeling in government was the worst is behind us, we can start getting our own books in order now. So you can see a decline in the level of government debt as a percentage of GDP, quite the market, and then the private sector started deleveraging again. Because the demand wasn't being pumped into the economy through the government spending, and suddenly the businesses weren't getting that revenue, they had to worry about their debts, which were still massive compared to where they were in the early 1920s and they started paying their debt down again and bang unemployment went from about 10% back up to 20. Now the recovery was driven by World War II and I haven't actually seen, I hadn't actually pulled this data apart myself before putting this presentation together for Dennis. So I had the, I had the ratio data but not the actual raw numbers. So what you find is the deleveraging that ended the crisis and got us back to the level where private debt is what it should be, which is something of the order of 50, between 50 and 75% of GDP, it's where it's, it reached a peak of 300, still about 250. That period of deleveraging only really took off when the government spending went through the roof, when all stops were out. Nobody debated whether there should be a deficit to fight Hitler okay, or the Japanese. So that total dedication to spending whatever it takes to win, to win the war then you had this huge increase in government debt, 
And with that huge increase in government debt, the private sector, which would only slightly deleave it, as you can see here, that's the maximum level of private debt of $160, $70 billion dollars in 1929-30, paid down and then it flatlines for all those years. There's the dip. Now, it doesn't take much of a downturn, a reduction in private debt to cause a crisis. That's what caused the explosion in unemployment again. Then private debt rose, probably as firms were leveraging up and gearing up to, to build the armaments that won the Second World War. But then with this huge level of government spending, finally there's a radical deleveraging by the private sector at the end of the crisis with very little impact on GDP. By that stage, we got ourselves out of the crisis. Now, taking a look at the, 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 the total period and really going, going further on, you can see that it, was, it wasn't austerity that ended the crisis. It was government spending on a grand scale. This is now looking at change in private debt, change in public debt. Were it not for that dramatic increase in public debt during the Second World War, the Depression could have lasted maybe another decade. And what I see that's been caused by is this huge overhang of private debt that was taken on for speculative reasons that has to be worked out of the economy to get it back to the stage where the economy is functional once more. But that can cause, as we've seen in Japan, two decades of sluggish economic performance. And that's the danger I see for America that it's likely, likely to, uh, to go through. So now looking at that the long run picture of the, the, the effective demand story. You can see the downturn caused by the Great Depression, the second one caused by, I believe, the government worrying too much about its own accounts in 37 and believing the crisis was over, and then the whole thing being ended only by the attempt to fight the Second World War. Well, that's my full picture, so some takeaway points at the end there. First of all, a, 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 private debt and public debt both matter, not just one, okay? and they're independent to some extent. Again, this is something where I differ from a lot of my fellow non-orthodox economists who argue that one is the mirror image of the other. That's not true. And in the accounting sense, when you record it at the end and treat the entire private sector, including the banks, as one entity, then it's true that if you make one entity as a public and the other as private, because of the accounting balances that occur, a deficit of one is perfectly matched by a surplus of the other. However, when you break the private sector down and include the banking sector in there, then the private sector, which borrows from the private banks, can increase or decrease its debt levels independently of what the government does. But the real danger is they affect each other. Fairly subtle ways. Now, if you have a period of rising private debt, that can enable the public sector to pay its debt down, which we saw the normal situation from the 1950s right through to when the crisis began. Equally, when the private sector debt starts plunging, public debt's likely to rise. But it's possible for each group to make independent decisions about what to do, which is what the fiscal cliff is about. Now, I think if you then have the government deciding to cut its debt, that could actually trigger a renewal of the, down, the, the payment the process of paying down the debt by the private sector. And I call that level of, of debt the rock of Damocles. You know the old story of the sword of Damocles. I, I see that's what the, the fiscal cliff is for you. It's the sword hanging over Congress saying, make a decision or it drops on the 31st of December. But my danger is the rock of Damocles, that, that huge hump of debt still sitting there in the private sector. And if the fiscal cliff triggers that renewed downward process, then that will come down and crush the economy once more back into a downturn. So you have all these complex dynamics we need to be careful about. We have to make private debt the important focus here. Okay. One of these days, getting public debt down may matter, will matter, but not now. And that's because, first of all, private debt is so much larger. Again, this is not common knowledge, but it's in the flow of funds, easy to find the data. And it's the driving factor. Generally speaking, the public sector is responding to what the government does. Uh, the, the government that's responding to what the private economy does. But if it tries to take a causal role, it could trigger that process with private debt. And, of course, the, the cause of the crisis with the collapse in private debt, the government debt only rose because of that private debt collapse, and that reduced the severity of the crisis. But we're still believing we're not in a crisis right now, or it's over behind us. I think it's the same sort of thinking as back in 36, 37. Now, premature end of that, we could have that renewed deleveraging by the private sector, and then you wouldn't just have a half trillion dollar slab taken out of the economy, you might get a two and a half trillion dollar slab taken out of the economy. It's really got that potential to it. So the main challenge of public policy is not to reduce government debt, but to shift the debate so we focus on that private debt and see that as the real thing we have to control. And that takes statesmanship, not simply slashing budgets. Thank you.
Professor Keene would be in order. Uh, you know, keep in mind that he may not be into the weeds as far as our politics, but um, this is uh, somewhat provocative in terms of uh, the received wisdom which yeah. we have here on the Hill right now, which is uh, there's a very strong feeling among some that government spending has to be cut, mm. but you're saying that you do that and you're going to see some deleveraging by the public sector. Private sector. Or yeah. the private sector, rather, yeah. and, and then you're looking at a uh, at, at more of an economic slide. That's right, because, again, we're just focusing upon the, private, the public sector debt reduction and then seeing what that does to GDP. That's the conventional debate. But if it does it to GDP plus change in private debt, then there's an enormous potential still for reduction in private debt to reduce spending even further. And so rather than, if you see the figures, you, this is one way one to think about the work you may have seen by Olivia Blanchard recently for the IMF, where they, who, and they were quite proponents of austerity. They were saying, in austerity, each $1 cut in government spending will at worst cause a half-dollar fall in GDP. Well, they then recalibrated after trying it in you know, the sad countries of southern Europe and found it was a $1 cut in government spending caused a $1.7 cut in GDP. But a lot of that spending itself was debt finance, so part of where that multiplier comes from is the impact upon the private debt, debt level. And again, with $40 trillion, roughly, or 30, $38, 39000000000000 trillion of private debt sitting there, any attempt to deliver by households or by the finance, by financial sector's own debt or by private corporations, and you could see a very large amplifier of what the government does in reducing demand. So we cut government spending right now, we could be, in effect, jumping off the cliff. Very good expression. I won't even try to top it. Any, any questions or comments? I assume your concern is about the uh, austerity that would happen immediately in terms of physical cliff and yeah. not about a long term uh, yeah. reductions that would reduce uh, future growth and debt. Yeah. It's what, it's what you're talking about, what, a $500 billion cut, effectively? Yeah, obviously, you're talking about very immediate impacts on yeah. the tax and spending side. Yeah, so on the 1st of January. Yeah, so long-term spending reductions, you would not have the same concern about. No, I think... Things that would really kick in yeah. next year are the problems. Yeah, you have to be very careful. It's, it, it's Ultimately, you do want to you know, reduce public sector debt, uh, but it's, that's ultimately so far in the future. It's not, a, not, a, not an important issue. And this public sector debt finance is a large part of what's productive in an economy to begin with. It's lack of awareness about that. We've had about 30 or 40 years where economic debate has tried to denigrate the role of government in the economy. And I'm a critic of uh, some aspects of government spending. And I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm not, not, I'm not a, a mainstream, you know, government's always good by any stretch. But you have to see there are, there's a role for the government in providing infrastructure, maintaining the capital you know, the capital base of the entire country. And we've denigrated that in the last 30 or 40 years in the debate. And really what's happened while well, we've been denigrating that, we've been ignoring this enormous private debt bubble, which rather than financing anything productive, largely financed asset bubbles. Yeah. Do, do, we already see, do we already see some of this effect in fear from small businesses because of what is going may happen? Yeah, yeah, and this is often, often what happens, again, people, the conventional economic theory tries to say the public sector goes one day, the private sector will go the opposite direction. You know, but often what happens is the public sector goes one way, the private sector will go the same way. So you mentioned the, private, the public sector decides to build a highway, you know, between here and, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, Baltimore or whatever. But you'll see private people making a decision to take out loans to build 7-Elevens along the highway. So there is a way they feed off each other. They're, they're not always in contradiction with each other. So if you have the private, the small businesses looking at it now and saying, hell, they'd actually know who their customers, where the customers work. Their customer coming in and chatting to them and saying, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to have a job on 1st of January. And the small business person in that situation is not going to be running up a large overdraft, not going to be considering expanding. So you'd get the downturn in government spending triggering a downturn in private spending as well. Not amazed. So <laughs> it's been great, great experience, um, and we see this as a huge problem because um, that that domino effect that you're talking about is really, really important to our yeah. businesses. And those contractors, when we talk about uh, di asking them to diversify, I was on a conversation uh, two days ago where where I'm like, so what what should I tell my folks? What 
exporting. Exporting. From uh, Washington. From, no, from, from, well, actually, we're Virginia, West Virginia, Pennsylvania. What's well, reasonable? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, but we're not big exporters. In no. General. We're not. And so asking them to diversify with not providing the right infrastructure and framework is going to be a really tough one. And the other thing, of course, so exporting is one of the few things that's totally a zero sum game. Exactly. You know, if, you, if you're trying to export your way out of it and China's trying to export their way out of it and Australia's. We, we can't do it, okay? It's, it's not a solution that everybody can do. So it's again very, that's the sort of advice you give when you haven't got any advice and you want to say something that doesn't make you sound totally stupid, but if you think about it, it does make you totally stupid. <laughs> I think you've got the right to change the distribution of tax. I mean, that talk about you know, removing the tax cuts from the upper levels, but balance it by tax, you know, increasing, removing tax benefits at the top level, providing them down the lower level. You still need government spending programs. That's all necessary. But ultimately, I don't think this is... This is if you imagine what it took us to get out of the Great Depression and how long it took and the pain that was involved in all that, and look at where we are now and see we've actually got, when we started the crisis, 1.7 times the level of private debt they had back in the end of the 1920s. So we've got ourselves a bigger hole we've dug ourselves into. I really don't think we can get out of it without deliberately reducing the debt by government action. And what I mean, I don't know by government spending, I mean deciding to write off the debt. Now, I, I don't know enough about this particular historical phase. I want to go back and read about it. But, you know, when Roosevelt came into power, one of the very first things he did was the bank holiday. Banks were shut down. I'm not sure for the period of time. It was about was it? Was it you'd know, Stephen. Any idea? Well, banks were already shutting down before he did that. It wasn't a holiday. It was just, yeah, closed yeah, forever. But yeah. It wasn't a write-off of the of the bank uh, debts at that point in time. Okay. And I think you're right. It was World War Two. That really did it. Really. Yeah. Did World War Two and all that expense. And then, when it was for war, the banks had no objection to creating money. <laughs> None whatsoever. Yeah. But they wouldn't do it at all. Yeah. For the good program. So we need. To, I mean, you know, I'm actually arguing what I call a, I mean, what I call a modern debt jubilee, because if you look back historically, ancient civilization, we know used to have jubilees. The story was once every 50 years, or 49 years most likely, and once well, once every time a, a, a king changed. After the uh, Sumerian Empire, that became instituted every 50 years. Literally, all debts were eliminated. That was a known pattern in society. Debt slaves were freed and so on. Uh, Michael Hudson's done some great historical work on that and the why that happened. We've got to the stage where we think creditors must be protected. Debt can't be written off. If you took out the debt, it's the responsibility of the debtors, etc., etc. But we think about it. What was that debt created to do? And who had the brain power in the negotiations over the level of debt? Was it the, was it the people lending the money or the people borrowing it? And you had this most bizarre situation where people who had no known capacity to pay, you know, the old ninja loans, were being lent money by people with, uh, you know, managers paying themselves multi-million dollars and more PhDs than you could poke uh, Cape Canaveral at. So the, the brain power and the responsibility, and I think the moral side of it, was on the lend side of the lenders, not the borrowers. The borrowers actually were trusting banks because that's one thing you should be able to do. The capitalist system functions well when you can trust the banks. But there's abuse of trust in the banks. They created debt they should never have created, should never have been allowed to be created, and they should never have been allowed to sell it to people in the public either through securitized loan, which they have done. So I've got this incredible mess. And if you try to forgive debtors now, a lot of people who see themselves as savers, because they've bought bonds, they've you know, got no debt and so on and so forth, they say, what about moral hazard? You can't let the debtors off. Now, my feeling is we have to acknowledge that. But a way to do that is to make a government cash injection, so Federal Reserve created, and they can do it under Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act. If you check Section 13.3, you can see the Federal Reserve can directly give money to private institutions. It doesn't have to give them to the banks alone. It takes a merchant situation, but they can do it. Give a cash injection, which goes to people you know, pro on a per capita basis. I really haven't tried to work out details of this, but something like that. And then if you're in debt, let's say you've got $100,000 per person. If you had debt, you would have to pay the debt down. No choice. The $100,000 would reduce your debt by $100,000, and that would be it. If you are not a debtor, you'd get $100,000 into your deposit account, which you could spend. Now, this would feed through the system, so the banks would be forced to write their debt down because they're having the debt paid off. 
securitised loans which were backed by that debt would also fall in value, so people who were savers would see the value of those bonds decline, but they'd be compensated by the cash injection. So something like that as a, as a deliberate policy to reduce the level of debt I think is necessary. And in fact in, in Germany a couple of groups are now working on what they're calling a debt audit, which is to work out who owes what, who owns the debt, and what should the level of debt be compared to income? Try to work out what level that might be operated at. I think an audit like that would be a very sensible thing to do. Yeah, James. Steve, you mentioned before that you think a, a sustainable level of private debt is between about 50 and 75 percent. Yeah. Right? So it's quite a way to go to get to that. That's the scary thing. I mean, uh, it, it's hard to work out what the level is. You'd need to really look and see what is debt used for. And, and for example, the, the, the sensible reasons to use debt in a market economy like ours is for investment when you want to invest more than retained earnings. That's, that's, that's a large part of where industrial growth and technological change comes from. And there are consumption items we can't afford to buy with our income, like buying a house and buying a car and so on. So there's necessary consumption, which has to be debt financed, and there's investment above retained earnings, which has to be debt financed. So the more entrepreneurial your society is, the more that investment debt finance will be necessary in my country, Australia had a 20-year period from 1945 to 65 where the debt ratio of the entire private sector, households and businesses, was 25% of GDP. Now, that's probably because we don't do much innovation down there. You know, we don't have the, you know, have the General Motors and the uh, General Electrics and all the stuff your, your country's been famous for doing that industrial development. So you need to borrow money for that. That might account like an additional 25% of GDP. So of that order, I think 50 to 75. That's almost two years worth of GDP below where you are now. I want to, uh, I want to thank you for taking this time to um, share this, uh, this years of research that you've done with um, members of congressional staff and committee uh, uh, staff. Uh, this is a very important time for us to consider these uh, points that you raise, particularly when Congress is about to make some decisions that uh, uh, without uh, enough thought could end up being counterproductive. Mm. So I, I'm uh, going to make sure that we get the information out uh, to uh, members and to staff who are not able to attend and uh, to make sure that this uh, great work that you've done gets uh, broad consideration. So I want to thank all of you for being here mm. and um, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thanks very much.